Kathleen Peterson was found dead at the bottom of the couple's staircase. Peterson's husband is novelist Michael Peterson. The cop was on me instantly. There was sufficient evidence to warrant a trial. The injuries are not consistent with a fall down the stairs. The charge, first degree murder. No way in this world my father ever would have hurt Kathleen. We're like, Dad, we believe you. He wanted to give the appearance that this was a wholesome, functioning family. What's going on, guys? It's Adrian from Do It Awesome, and this is going to be the review of the hit documentary on Netflix, The Staircase. Now, before I continue, just want to let you all know that there is going to be spoilers in this video. So if you haven't seen it yet and you don't want to know what happens, stop the video now and go watch it. And I suggest that you do because it's a great documentary in my opinion. Now the staircase takes place in Durham, North Carolina, and it's broken up into 13 episodes, or they call them chapters. And this documentary tells the story of Michael Peterson, a well-known novelist being accused of murdering his wife Kathleen when she's found at the bottom of a staircase in their Forest Hills mansion on December 9th, 2001. Michael calls 911 and explains to the operator that his wife fell down the stairs, but when police show up, the evidence tells them a completely different story. The film shows you video and photographs from the crime scene. It just looks like a bloodbath it is all around Kathleen's lifeless body at the bottom of the staircase. Michael's biological children, Todd and Clayton, as well as his adopted daughters, Martha and Margaret, they all believe that he's innocent, and there's absolutely no way that their father could have done this. Now, at first, Kathleen's biological daughter, Caitlin, she was on Michael's side and believed in his innocence, but after talking to the police and seeing photos from her mother's autopsy, she was swayed, and now she believes that Michael did, in fact, murder her mother. The pictures of Kathleen's autopsy shows several, and I believe it's seven, deep lacerations on the back of her head, which make police believe that she was beat or bludgeoned to death. But Michael's lead attorney, David Rudolph, and the rest of the defense team believe that those lacerations could be a result from falling backwards and hitting her head on the door frame and the wall. They also argue that the staircase in which she fell down it was very narrow and dark, and plus she had a blood alcohol level of 0.07 and Valium in her system as well. Now, I can understand both theories here of how she got those lacerations, but two things hurt both the defense and the prosecution, in my opinion. The thing that hurts the prosecution, and the defense team explained this as well, if Kathleen was beat or bludgeoned, why did she not have any skull fractures? I mean, yeah, she had deep lacerations. There's no argument there. But if somebody was beating another person over the head with an object and with such force, you would have skull fractures or contusions on the brain. Something. I understand that she could have hit her head and cracked it open from the fall and this is what hurts the defense the amount of blood period I mean there was a lot of blood now after some digging and investigating the prosecution find out that Michael Peterson is actually bisexual and they discuss motive because his marriage wasn't as perfect as everybody thought it was. Michael explains to his defense team that Kathleen knew that he was bi and she was okay with it. Now, I don't know if I really believe that, but hey, guess we'll never know. So the prosecution end up discovering a huge bombshell that really hurt Michael's case. The mother of Michael's adopted daughters was also found dead at the bottom of a staircase. And this was 17 years prior in Germany 
when Michael and his ex-wife Patty lived there in his military days. Her name was Elizabeth Ratliff, and she was best friends with Michael and Patty. The German police ruled out any type of foul play, and they concluded that the cause of death was an aneurysm. Now, there were some witnesses that say there was blood everywhere, and then there were some that said that there wasn't. So again, I don't know what to believe. The prosecution ends up digging up Elizabeth's body, driving the body all the way from Texas to North Carolina, just so their medical examiner, Deborah Radish, could conduct the autopsy. And this is the same one that concluded Kathleen's death was not accidental. This seemed a little fishy to me, only because they could have had a medical examiner perform the autopsy there in Texas, but they were hell-bent on having their examiner do it. Hmm. So, as I suspected, a few days later, the autopsy report comes back and it's concluded that Ratliff's death was due to a homicidal attack. Throughout this whole documentary, I had a weird vibe about the prosecution team, but that's just my opinion. Michael Peterson's trial began July 1st, 2003. The prosecution basically comes out of left field with the theory that involved a blow poke. They believe that the blow poke was the murder weapon because they never actually found a murder weapon. One reason they came up with this theory is because Kathleen's sister Candace gave Kathleen one and it was missing. So the prosecution ran with this theory pretty much through the entire trial. They then move on to explaining blood spatter patterns and how long it takes for blood to dry, how and why there was some blood on Michael's clothing from both the prosecution and the defense. Several medical and forensic experts take the stand and they explain their theories, answer questions, and provide their evidence. I thought some of them seemed like they knew what they were talking about and they were very confident in what they were explaining. And then there were others that were very smug and arrogant and just looked like they had no idea what the hell was going on or what they were even saying. The one that stands out is Dwayne Deaver, a blood spatter expert and an agent of the SBI, the State Bureau of Investigation. This dude was a complete joke. You could tell that he was no professional whatsoever. He conducted tests and experiments to get the same blood spatter that was on the wall in the staircase. However, the way that he conducted these tests were done in ways that did not match with a fall or a real beating. He was all over the place with his experiments. And while I watched his testimony, I was actually laughing because he just seemed like he was so lost. He didn't understand, again, what the hell he was saying. Not to mention, he ended up getting busted by saying he wrote a report about doing a Lumalite test, but the report was never given to the defense. And that's a big no-no. So two days after day 50 of the trial, David Rudolph is called to the Peterson home because Michael's son, Clayton, finds the missing blow poke in the garage. David and Ron Jurette, the private investigator for the defense, they examine the blow poke and call in a professional photographer to document the cobwebs and dead bugs on it to show that the poker had been there for a while. They also had it tested to see if any blood or DNA was on it. 
which it didn't. It came back clean. When they presented it in the courtroom, the prosecution looked a little disappointed because that was their smoking gun. And now the mysterious blowpoke that they thought was disposed of is there and there's absolutely no evidence on it. On October 10th, 2003, after five days of deliberation, the jury came back with a unanimous verdict of guilty of first-degree murder. Michael Peterson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I was shocked when I heard this verdict only because there was some fishy statements and witnesses and theories that the prosecution provided. I really can't say that I believe that Michael's innocent, but I also can't say that he's guilty. I still don't know. Again, just my opinion. Well, in episode nine, we find out that at least one of my suspicions about the prosecution was correct. And there were, in fact, some crooked factors and people in play. In November of 2011, eight years since Michael was convicted, David Rudolph comes back after so many appeals and has a great chance to reopen Michael's case. Remember the so-called blood spatter expert from the SBI, Dwayne Deaver? Well, he was, in fact, guilty of hiding test results, he concocted bizarre experiments to shore up a prosecutor's case and a bunch of other key elements. Deaver's testimony was the most important evidence presented at Peterson's trial. The blood stain inside Michael's shorts. So basically, Deaver did a blood spatter test and it had nothing to do with the way that they thought Kathleen would have been struck. He did it in a way so that he could get the blood stain on the inside of his shorts to say, yep, Michael did it. Deaver not only screwed over Michael Peterson, but others as well, including a man named Greg Taylor, who served 17 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. I think this weasel needs to be put behind bars for messing with people's lives, because that's just wrong. On to December 6th of 2011, that started the hearing for a retrial, because Michael Peterson wasn't given a fair trial, and it's his constitutional right to have one. So on December 9th, 2011, Peterson was granted a new trial and was freed and two, the new trial would begin. David Rudolph discussed a plea agreement with the new district attorney, Roger Eccles, who was open to it until Kathleen's sisters, Candace and Lori, and Kathleen's daughter, Caitlin, fought against that. That, in turn, swayed the DA to not agree to the agreement, and Rudolph pretty much had enough. He explained to Michael that he was living in Charlotte now, and he was just burnt out on the case. He had enough. Rudolph then passed Michael on to the lawyer that handled Greg Taylor's case. And I hope that I pronounce his last name right, but his name was Mike Klingsom. So he's now working with Michael Peterson, and he thinks they have a good case, and they might be able to dismiss Michael's case altogether. Well... He ends up having a damn stroke two weeks before he's set to argue that motion to dismiss Peterson's case. So in steps his second chair, Mary Jude Darrow, or Darrow, however you pronounce it. Her and Jim Hendricks, a private investigator, find that the evidence boxes and bags were tampered with and ripped open. They then argue in court that there can't be a fair trial now because the evidence has been tainted. But once again, Michael gets screwed and the judge says pretty much, oh well, that's nothing. We're going to reschedule a retrial anyway. 
Now, Rudolph sees this and comes back on to the case. He sees that this is just ridiculous, like I thought as well. So Michael and his family have, they've just had it, they've had enough, and instead of risking his life once again by putting it in the hands of a jury and a corrupt justice system, as Michael puts it, he discusses with Rudolph and agrees to just do the Alford plea. It basically says that he's guilty of voluntary manslaughter, but he's not saying that he's guilty of killing Kathleen. So then he goes there, does the Alford plea, and he's free to go. Doesn't have to serve any more time because it's already time served for when he was in jail before for eight years. And that's pretty much it. They show Michael talking to the camera more, talking about life and everything else. But all in all, I, I really, really enjoyed this documentary. I thought it was very good, very well made. However, it was a one-sided viewpoint. This film was made so that the viewer could have sympathy for Michael Peterson. Plus, you know, it had all the facts and evidence, statements made from the defense team and the Peterson family. So it is hard to say if he did it if he did murder Kathleen, or if he didn't murder her, if it really was an accident. The prosecution still, they seemed fishy to me, even though this documentary was on Michael's side, and I realized that. But, I mean, come on. One of the lead people that testified for the prosecution got busted for being a straight-out liar. So, honestly, it really depends on the individual that watches this film, and they have to decide for themselves, bottom line. So, for those of you that watched this, what did you think? Did you enjoy it as much as I did? And do you think that he murdered his wife? Or do you think it was an accident that sent an innocent man to prison for eight years? Let me know in the comments section down below. All right, guys, that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to leave a like, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. I hope you guys have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video. See ya!